So uh, now I want to introduce um, Leighton Koo. He's a professor in health policy and management at the Milken Institute in the School of Public Health at George Washington University. Um, uh, Professor Koo's career has been built around understanding and improving access to affordable health care, um, something that we all know is not an easy thing to, to do, um, if you've heard anything about um, affordability and the exchanges lately. Um, so he has, his entire career had a very um, difficult challenge and continues to be challenged to try to figure that one out. Um, he's also looked at topics more, more broadly on healthcare reform, Medicaid, um, the healthcare safety net, preventative services, and immigration health. Um, he has authored dozens of research articles in journals such as Health Affairs, American Journal of Public Health, and New England Journal of Medicine. Um, he often testifies before Congress and numerous state legislatures and has worked with policymakers and advocates across the nation. So he very much has his um, finger on the pulse of what's happening um, in, in current healthcare policies. So um, if you have any questions about that, perhaps at the end he might uh, be willing to entertain that as well. Um, he directs GW's Multidisciplinary Center for Health Policy Research, which includes over 20 faculty and 50 staff. Um, uh, very interesting that he also sits on the executive board for the DC's Health Benefits Exchange Authority, so that's DC's um, healthcare exchange, or what some people also call the marketplace. Um, we had a chance to talk to him about that last night at dinner, and it's fascinating stuff. Um, uh, and uh, um, he might be willing to entertain questions around that as well. But today, his talk will focus on using health insurance to promote population health goals. Um, specifically focusing on how Medicaid policy can promote smoking cessation. So with that, welcome. Who's the speaker? Who is series? Michael Davis. Um, he, uh, he started um, our graduate program in health administration and policy way back in 1934, uh, but he is also a famous um, person in health policy in the U.S., so okay. I'll tell you more about him afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you very much for inviting me and for being such a, a gracious host at dinner last night. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm Leighton Koo. And you know, I, I'll say I, I, I often feel sort of strange giving a talk in academic environments because there's part of me that doesn't exactly feel like a real academic. I mean, I sort of have traipsed around various careers. So I've been an advocate. I was a researcher at the Irma Institute. I was basically sort of an advocate at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. I've been a government bureaucrat. Uh, so. I've only, it's only been in the past several years that I've, I've sort of been a, an academic, so I, this part of me still feels a little bit like a fake. Um, nonetheless, hopefully you'll, you, you won't see through my, uh, my disguise too badly today. Uh, and, and partly the other thing I guess I'd say is, I mean, the thing that I think is important about health policy and health administration is what is the a application ultimately to the real world? How can we do things to improve policy? So, I mean, so that's always been... Uh, very much at the, at the forefront of my view. So this is really sort of what motivated this question. I mean, I, for, for years, much of my career has been sort of focused really on access and, and questions and so on and so forth. And so I've, I've done lots of things looking at sort of how can we change Medicaid in terms of changing eligibility policies, or how can we change financing policies to help things or to help things like community health centers and so on. And so this is, is really sort of focusing on, on something that sort of uh, a different topic, which is how can we make health insurance, essentially speaking, perform better from a population health perspective. And I'll say that part of this is, in fact, partly because, you know, sort of the, the triumph of the Affordable Care Act, though a lot of states have still not expanded Medicaid. I'll be honest, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, did I think we were going to have an expansion in Medicaid of the scope of the one that we've had, I would have said, you've got to be out of your mind. It is never going to happen. It is such a struggle. Uh, you know, sort of the, the, the politics and the budget issues are, are so uh, uh, horrendous uh, that it wouldn't be likely. And yet here we are, now Medicaid serving about 70 million people. I mean, it's just enormous. It's, it continues to grow, uh, at, at least for the time being, I hope. Um, so, you know, there's part of me that says, well, so are we getting good value out of the program? Is it doing what we hope it should do? So that was what sort of led me to this question. So a little background. So. Now I'm in a public health school. So from the public health school, I know that smoking is the number one preventable cause of morbidity and mortality. 
every now and then there are people who are sort of obesity uh, related researchers and we argue about like, you know, which is worse. But anyway, they're, they're both way up there. This is what CDC says is the number one preventable cause of morbidity and mortality. But Medicaid is a particularly high risk population. Generally speaking, about a third of people who are on Medicaid smoke. So they have a, a, a prevalence rate that is twice that of the national population. So in addition to this, there are analyses that have basically said maybe somewhere in the order of a seventh of all Medicaid expenditures are, are, are related to smoking. So if you cost that out, this year it's like $75 billion in medical expenditures that are attributable to smoking. So this is a lot of money. Historically, this has been important. The biggest lawsuit in American history, or at least used to be, I don't know if it still is, was the Master Settlement Agreement in 1998, in which the tobacco industry agreed to pay $200 billion to states uh, over time, all justified because smoking was, it was driving up Medicaid costs. So it's one of these issues that has been ticking around for a long time. So there are these national health objectives to reduce smoking and to expand smoking cessation coverage. So you'd think we'd have really done something pretty good. And so, in fact, when I tried to be, begin to figure out, well, how well have we done? Has it, has it really been working very well? That wasn't so easy to figure out. Uh, so that was what sort of started us. We're sort of midway into that process now and, and trying to figure out a little more. So the big picture. The big picture is that insurance is not particularly well set up to deal with prevention. I mean, generally speaking, our medical care system and our insurance system is based on an acute care model in which bad things happen, people get sick, and you need treatment for that. All important. So the traditional concept in health insurance uh, of what defines what is coverable, and that is the key question in insurance, is what things are covered, is medical necessity. And medical necessity implied that there had to be a diagnosis of something that made treatment medically necessary or appropriate. So traditionally, prevention services weren't in there. You were healthy, or you were close to healthy, so there was no illness. So there's, you know, what's medically necessary in that domain. And then in addition to this, insurers were always sort of bothered by this concept like we're going to do something now when someone's healthy. and You say it's going to save money years down the line. This person might not be my member years down the line, so what do I care? So this was something that had traditionally has been a weak area in, in insurance, not to mention there's the final thing, that patients don't come into the doctor and say, in most cases, you know, gee, I'm healthy, please, you know, do something for me. You know, generally they come in, they say, I'm sick, my knee hurts, I'm coughing, you know, whatever. And that's what I want care for. So nonetheless, solely but surely prevention services have been added. The Affordable Care Act sort of required coverage for uh, effective prevention services, so vaccinations, contraception, smoking cessation, et cetera. So that was a big gain. Uh, where I first started in the sort of area looking at tobacco cessation a few years, just sort of as a, as a random project, uh, I became involved with some people in Massachusetts who had... Uh, the same year of their health reform had begun a comprehensive Medicaid cessation benefit for smoking. And so the health department worked with the Medicaid agency to develop a fairly broad outreach plan. They had quit lines. They did lots of stuff. Uh, earlier research basically could show that smoking prevalence fell among Medicaid smokers uh, pretty substantially, fell by about 10 percentage points. Uh, they also found that the rate of cardiovascular hospitalizations fell among users by about a third to a half. And this was in about a year and a half. So this was a fairly rapid change. Now, I will say, as someone who didn't know a lot about smoking then, in fact, still really don't know a whole lot about smoking, uh, I would say, you know, like, what about emphysema, lung cancer? Aren't those the things that you expect to change? And the answer is, actually, people who know more about actual medical stuff tell me, no, those are things that are very slow to change. You need to have stopped smoking for a fairly protracted period before those gains happen. But cardiovascular health improves pretty quickly because they're specific antagonists uh, in, in cigarette smoke that are, are directly lead to uh, adverse cardiovascular effects. But anyway, so we did a little cost-benefit study and basically found that for every dollar that had been sent on cessation benefits, there was about a $3 reduction in lower Medicaid hospital costs. So there was a $2 return on investment. So this was this kind of thing. I thought, damn, this is good. It's a win-win. You make people healthier and you save money. What could be better? And then what I found, and so I've been doing Medicaid stuff for a long time, so a lot of people who were sort of Medicaid leaders at federal and state levels are old friends of mine. I thought they'd be excited. 
and I talked to people about this, and the Medicaid people sort of went and yawn. The public health people got very excited. This was big news to the public health people. The Medicaid people, their perspective was, well, you know, we got these Medicaid expansion things to deal with, and, you know, it's not systems change, and it's not value-based care, and it's not fitting in the parameters, and the governor or the federal government's not telling us to do this stuff, and we let them cover tobacco cessation benefits. So it's not really our job. This is not our thing. So very nice. Go away. Anyway, so I haven't, I've stuck in and continue to dig at this. But so at this point, all states cover at least some tobacco cessation benefits. Uh, and it's, it you know, used to be pr very much oriented towards pregnant women. It's now gone to sort of uh, adults in general. There's still barriers that exist like co-payments and prior authorization. By the way, you can feel free to ask questions at any time if you like. A problem remains that lots of physicians and patients aren't aware of these benefits. This is not the sort of traditional thing that a patient thinks, aha, this is something I can get benefits for. It may be particularly an issue that a lot of the traditional things that people get for uh, smoking cessation are things like uh, nicotine patch or nicotine gum, which are over-the-counter benefits. And so traditionally, insurers don't pay for over-the-counter benefits. Medicaid is a little different. Medicaid will pay for them if it's prescribed. But so there's this general sort of knowledge and awareness problem. It's at least one thing. So where there has been some information that's collected, typically it's what do states cover. They cover this drug. They cover this kind of therapy. They don't cover that kind of therapy. But not much was known about sort of actual benefit utilization. So we came up with a project, and it's been funded in part by NH and now more recently by the Robert Wood Johnson Pro uh, Foundation to sort of try to understand this a little better. So we were trying to actually look at utilization data, which states are doing well, why do states differ, how are these associated with actual smoking behavior, and then ultimately, so how can we do a better job? How can we bolster smoking cessation? How can we try to get people to quit more? Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, this will save some money, too. So I have to go a little bit into some of the details of cessation therapy. So, uh, uh, you know, this is not a surprise. It is tough for people who are smokers to, to quit. Are any of you smokers? My, my guess would be, you know, these days among upper middle class, well-educated people, smoking is pretty rare. Smoking has become sort of a class-related uh, issue in the U.S. to a great extent. But anyway, it's tough. I mean, it's sort of like a dieting thing. You know, it's easy to say you should quit. It's not so easy to do it. Uh, so there are often repeated attempts that are needed. So medications do help. Uh, they, they increase quit rates. Uh, they're not perfect. There are three principal types of approved therapy. One are what are called nicotine replacement therapies, and so those are things like the patch gum uh, and, and their various other lesser forms. And then there are a couple of pills. Uh, there's bupropion or Zyban, uh, which is used both for smoking cessation as an antidepressant. Uh, there's Renaclin, better known by its brand name Chantix. You every man then see it advertised on TV. And that's a brand name drug. And that is considered actually the most effective of the medications, but it's, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, you know, one of the new issues that's coming up in this area is where do e-cigarettes fit in? And the answer is this is still a big area of major scientific and medical debate. I suspect this issue will not be settled in any definitive way for a long time. And will FDA at some point approve e-cigarettes as, as a form of cessation therapy? I don't know. You know I, I think it's probably years away is my guess. So the next question is then thinking, like, how do you go uh, sort of to think about how do you go from policies and what's influencing policies? So this is sort of on the left-hand side to where ultimately we might think is the right-hand side, which is the patient. So where does the patient actually take therapy? Do they try to quit? Do they get medications? Do they get counseling? And then ultimately, do they quit? What are the health outcomes? And that's way on the right-hand side. But there's all this stuff that gets in the way. So there's the fact that there's Medicaid agencies and there's public health agencies, and they're both trying to do things in this area. But in point of fact, they don't really, in general, have direct contact with any patients, or in fact, for that matter, with any doctors. So in many cases, they're going through managed care plans. Then there are some parts that involve doctors. There are some parts that involve counselors. There are quit lines. So it, this path is not straightforward of sort of who influences what. And this is, I suspect, you know, one of the problems is it's easy to say in policy we want to sort of help people quit and we want help to help people get these medications. There are a lot of little steps in the path that, that are less easy to, to, to get through. So where we began was we looked uh, at a uh, unique source of drug utilization data. So uh, Medicaid has this 
policy where basically speaking there are these things called Medicaid rebates. And every drug pretty much uh, in the U.S. gets a Medicaid rebate. Uh, if it's sold and, and approved, then a side effect of that is that the rebates are based on the volume of drugs. So because of this, there's a reporting system that has been developed that basically every three months, all the manufacturers report to states, states report to the federal government says, this is how much of this pill we bought, this is how much of that pill we bought, and so on and so on and so on. That usually is not used for very much unless you're really into sort of, uh, you know, drug analysis. But anyway, the whole system adds up to a lot. It's $16 billion a year we spend in drug rebates in Medicaid, so it's a lot of money. Uh, so however, you can then use this to get information about the level of FDA-approved medications. And so we did this uh, on unfortunate problems. This information used to be updated and relatively easy to find on the web. It has gone dark recently. I recently filed a Freedom of Information Act request to try to get the data again. God knows when we're going to get this data again. Uh, there are other dilemmas that happen in this. I mean, anytime you do data analysis, the concepts are clear. The reality is messy. So bupropion is sometimes yeah, CMS keeps the data. And they kept the website up? But just they kept the website up and they closed it recently. And they're not completely clear about why they closed it. It's been hinted to us that it has to do with privacy reasons. I don't quite see what the privacy issue is because there was not any naming any individuals or even any companies. It would just say something like bupropion, you know, 100 pills for a given state in a given three months. But, you know, what the hell? Uh, you know, for the time being, uh, we can't get the updates on it. We got, you know, some up until recently. Uh, so one of the main drugs, uh, bupropion, is sometimes used as an antidepressant. So then there's this problem, okay, we now know that people got bupropion. Why did they get it? And the answer is, it's not easy to know why they got it. Did they get it because they were smoking? Did they get it because they were depressed? And then the unfortunate thing is depression and smoking are correlated. So you can be both. One leads to the other. Uh, so we had to sort of make some semi-arbitrary ways to, to uh, restrict what we were using. Uh, so then we had other data. We had to sort of build up our data. So this drug utilization data is, is aggregate. It's not, it doesn't say John Jones got this pill. Uh, it doesn't have data about the characteristics of users. So, uh, and there are other ways in principle to get it. We, I was just talking with Professor Grogan on Medicaid claims data. They're available, but they're sort of unwieldy and slow. So there, there are problems with this. So we had to come up with, so we have a numerator now of sort of how many pills of various sorts or, or sprays or patches, et cetera, got, got uh, purchased. Uh, we needed to build up denominators, so we had to then come up with this other issue of ca estimating how many Medicaid adults were smokers, which in and of itself, there are data challenges that are related to this. Nonetheless, after doing all this, this is sort of a snapshot of what we could learn for 2013. So in 2013, nationwide, there were about 1.7 million prescriptions that were done. And these were the three major classes of drugs. Uh, and then how much was spent on it. So bupropion was the biggest one. So that's where it's a little challenging, where we're not exactly sure whether bupropion was being used for mental health purposes versus for smoking cessation. This is still a you know, conservative estimate. Uh, and then, you know, a fair amount in terms of nicotine replacement therapies and then a little less for, for Chantix or Varenicline. On the other hand, Varenicline is the most expensive. So from the, the cost side of things, that's half the money. And the others are, are relatively cheaper. But the bottom line that I think is important to note is that in total, though med smoking costs Medicaid about $100 billion, $75 billion a year, we're spending about $100 million a year to promote smoking cessation. So to my mind, this is the thing that's sort of crazy from a policy perspective. Here's something that we know is a huge resource use, cost a lot in terms of health, and we're doing so damn little to deal with this. And so this was you know, one of the things that's frustrating to me. So we have some data about uh, the prevalence of smoking and data that we sort of estimated. So Again, when we looked over a number of years, there's been a slight reduction in the, in the percent of people who are smokers. And so this is one of the big triumphs of public health is that actually the smoking rate in the U.S. Has, has dropped a lot. But again, tends to be sort of it's among sort of more educated middle class people. It's dropped a lot. Among low-income people, the, the, the reduction has been, has been less. 
so we can estimate at about how many adult Medicaid smokers there are. There are about 8 million adult Medicaid smokers. This is before the Medicaid expansions. These numbers should be higher now. Uh, we could also figure out, essentially speaking, what the utilization rate. So this middle call row is, is the estimated percent of smokers who are receiving medication. So it's about 10 percent. And I will say it's gone back and forth of, is this a high number or a low number? Some people say, wow, 10 percent. I would never have guessed it was that high. Uh, you know, you talk to public health people, public health people would say, oh, it should be 100 percent. Until it's 100 percent, we're not happy. So it's, 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 it's neither zero nor 100 percent. I can say this with great certitude. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, is it a high or low number? I'm not exactly sure, except one thing that we could see was that there was a lot of variation among states. So one of the states that was really high was like the rate was like 25 percent. And then there were states like my home state of Texas was like at zero percent. So there's variation. So at the very least, I feel okay about saying states could do more. How much more is plausible or possible, I'm not exactly sure, but they could do more. So we sort of mapped out what, you know, the prevalence among various states and then so the light blue ones are the states that have relatively low rates, the dark blue ones are the ones that have high rates, and then the, the medium blue ones are the ones that are in the middle. And so does this map look like anything familiar to people? <laughs> it looks like a Medicaid expansion map or the red and blue state map. And so, you know, I'm not saying that Medicaid expansion or politics per se was driving any of these things because I suspect that these things these are actually dated from before the Medicaid expansions went into effect. Nonetheless, it tells you that there's something going on there. So uh, this was at that point about sort of basically saying, uh, you know, states could do more to promote smoking cessation. And so, you know, I'll say, again, we didn't find sort of clear correlations between which states had higher smoking prevalence and which were doing more utilization. This is where we're, we're looking some more. It's on the expansion versus the non-expansion perspective. So then we sort of looked at which are the expanding states, which are the non-expanding states. And we see that the non-expanding rates start out with a higher percentage of smokers uh, and a lower rate of smokers who are receiving medications. And while I don't think that the Medicaid expansion, you know, the failure to make, expand Medicaid made people in that state light up because they're now so stressed that they have to smoke, I don't think that happened. Uh, and, and I don't think it made them think, well, their life is so miserable, you know, why should I try to quit smoking? You know, why bother? Uh, nonetheless, it, it does mean that there's, these states are having a, a basically a, a higher health toll. So they're going to have more illness, they're going to be more having more Medicaid expended, uh, expenditures because they have more smokers and because their smokers aren't doing very much to stop smoking. So this is, 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 is a real sort of problem for these states. Uh, and, and yet, you know, they decided they didn't want to expand Medicaid. You can sort of say, well, that's their problem. Uh, so, you know, this is, is going to cause a, a growing problem in, in tobacco-related burdens. Uh, so then sort of this issue that sort of, so that was one stage of this research. We published some of this in Health Affairs in an article. I think it came out earlier last year. Uh, maybe it was this year. I forget which. Uh, I'm getting old and confused. So. The next stage was then to think about sort of why are some states doing more and why are some states doing less. And so part of this had to do with this notion, from my mind, and when I talk to a lot of people, this is a perfect area where Medicaid agencies and public health agencies could be collaborating. So these days in the health policy world, people talk a lot about the triple aim. They say health insurance and health policy should be doing things to improve population health. And then typically when I hear people say this, they say something like this is, this is the low-hanging fruit. We cover these things with, with insurance policies already. We know it's important. We know smokers want to quit. And so why aren't we doing this very well? So one thing people said, well, gee, you know, Medicaid and the public health agency should work together. So we actually have, I'll talk a little about a little case study we did on collaboration between Medicaid and public health agencies. And the other thing we did, we did some, some other sort of uh, more quantitative analysis. And so I'm actually think I'm going to talk about the quantitative analysis first because that paper is just about to come out. So, so here we did an analysis basically that said what are the determinants of medication use, uh, so prescription fills for smoke or for every state from over five years. So we had developed a time series uh, and so we have a little panel for those who, who use that kind of analysis. 
so we can sort of see what things were associated with, with when uh, medication use went up or down and what was distinguishing it. And we could include lots of uh, policy coverages, things, things like were Medicaid states covering these different types of medications where there were restrictions. We could include other smoking related policies like what's the level of cigarette taxes that they have, do they have smoke free laws that sort of restrict smoking in public areas, what's the overall public uh, smoking prevalence in case you think that there are sort of norms within a state. Uh, we could also then look at, at do quit lines provide uh, medications also because that might bias the data. If people are getting their medications for free through a quit line, people know what quit lines are, maybe it's yeah, worried about quit lines. So quit lines, every state, uh, and then the federal government runs some, one too, has uh, a quit line. So there are 1-800 numbers that you can call and you can say, I'm a smoker, I need some help uh, quitting. And they will give you some level of brief counseling over uh, the phone. In some cases, uh, they will also provide some free medication. So in a lot of places, you know, if you, uh, they'll say, you know, we can arrange for you to get, you know, a month of a uh, nicotine patch and here's a little voucher and you go to the pharmacy and pick it up. Uh, so, you know, this is something that's, that's going on. Basically, every state has one. Uh, this is actually one of the main ways that health departments actually are able to track anything about, about utilization is through use of their quit lines. Um, so, but again, so the quit lines may be coming from the public health department as opposed to from Medicaid for the same people. Uh, so that might be something that was a buy. So we could look at those things. So we did panel data analysis. We used two-way fixed effects. And, and the part of that, for those of you who are not uh, in, into these techie things, uh, basically, it helps us sort of control for unmeasured state factors uh, and for secular changes, and really sort of helps us focus on what are the changes in policies and how do the changes in policies, uh, can they in some way that approximates causation uh, be viewed as being related to changes in, in utilization. Uh, so what we found was uh, sort of interesting, you know, sort of, one that was really sort of a surprise was a lot of states have this requirement that you have to get counseling in order to get access to the tobacco cessation medications. And this was associated with less use. And part of the reason it was a little surprising was that I think states were doing this out of good intentions. There were information that said, gee, you should couple counseling with drugs. That's the most effective. So they'd say, you have to do both. And in fact, what happens is it leads some people to not do either. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, we didn't find, and, and we found that having a broader selection of medications was associated with greater use too. So that's a, you know, that's uh, useful and hopefully will help spur states to cover everything, which CDC and uh, HHS have been recommending for many years, but doesn't necessarily happen. We didn't find significant effects of various things like co-payments or prior authorization. That was a little surprising when I've done work in this area in general. Co-payments, even modest co-payments, reduce utilization. So we didn't find that. I was also sort of surprised that we didn't find sort of broader things like from the smoking realm in general, the, the two things that we know work to reduce the prevalence of smoking are, are taxes uh, and the smoke-free laws, the public restrictions on smoking. And neither of those, and in fact, general smoking prevalence wasn't correlated with changes in, in utilization. Uh, and I have various thoughts about why that might be. Maybe they're associated with, with whether you smoke, but not whether you're trying to quit. Our measure of utilization sort of presumes that you're a smoker already, and then are you trying to quit? So it might not affect that. And, and then the good thing was the quit line medications weren't biasing things either. So one of the big limitations here was that some of the things that are well-known cases of where there are states like Massachusetts that have this special state initiative where